The views and opinions expressed by the Orc of Ominous, the Wicked Nemesis, are of my own and no one else, nor do they reflect beyond ringside. So, ladies and gentlemen, due to the graphic nature of this program, listener discretion is advised. Dead, dead, nine, eight, 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 seven, 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 six, six, five, 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 four, 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 three, three two, 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 one, 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 one zero. zero. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Wednesday night, Wrestling Wednesday as we affectionately call it on Twitter. It is the To Be Determined show right here on its new home, BeyondRingside.com, part of the Beyond Ringside radio network. I am the Oracle of Ominous, the Architect of Intellect, the Wicked Nemesis, and joining me is my co-host, Magic City Motormouth himself, Fast Eddie Lane. Eddie, how you doing tonight, sir? Greetings, good evening. How the hell are you? It's been a great week so far. Let's have some fun and kick some ass. Oh, man, it's been a heck of a week, especially if you like wrestling. It seems that even the most casual fan is still talking about wrestling, which is always good for our industry. So big props to WWE and for TNA with whatever they're doing uh, to continue to keep it on everyone's lips, you know, just to feel the water. But Eddie, yes. how are you doing, sir? How, how is everything on the home front? Uh, steady. I'm actually, my father has actually completed all of his radiation treatments. Uh, those who know, you knew that he had cancer and he's gone through 47 treatments and he's done. We're waiting for about six weeks. He's going to go back in, have some testing done. Uh, me personally, I'm still certifiably insane. And I'm sure we all knew that, but just in case you didn't, <laughs> tonight our guest coming up at about 9.30 Central Standard Time, 9.35 I guess I should say, Central Standard Time, we have Wrestling With Pop Culture's own Jonathan Williams. For those that don't know, make sure you go and check that out. I know there is a uh, Facebook fan page for Wrestling With Pop Culture. Oh, it is an amazing thing. Uh, he reviews movies. He reviews uh, just all types of things. Also, uh, one, a personal friend of mine and a great uh, friend of the show, uh, Phantom Troublemaker on Twitter does a lot of blogs for them with reviews and everything nerdish and everything wrestling. Also, Monstrosity Championship Wrestling, he's a part of that out of Atlanta, kind of has a cult following. A lot of people seem to like that. For those wanting to call in, 205-316-9900 is the number, but we're going to just jump straight in. Oh, and by the way, let me not forget... The cult favorite, yes, the cult darling himself, Smark Rage, with the Smarks Rage, will be on tonight later on in the show. We want to give a shout out to our co-host, Tasha Simone, who is actually on vacation right now. That's right. Tasha taking a little bit of time away to, you know, to uh, replenish, you know, when you're kicking everybody's ass, you got to take a you know, week off. So she is on location right now, I believe, in Beirut, because that's where she likes to go to unwind. So, uh, but Eddie... Yes. Raw. Raw. I mean, let, let's just jump right in. We usually save Raw towards the end. But WWE Raw, we're, we're building up to, to the to the Royal Rumble. Now, I asked a question, and I don't want your, I don't want your answer right now, Eddie, because I'm going to let you, I'm sorry, whew, I'm going to let you think about it. Uh, your favorite moment over the last 20 years of Monday Night Raw, I've asked uh, this on Twitter and on Facebook, and we're actually going to read some of the answers on air and if you'd like to call in and be a part 205-316-9900 you actually be on air and tell us live your favorite moment over the last 20 years of monday night raw but now let's talk about what happened this past monday eddie i mean it was just i mean the build-up you had rock and, and punk actually you know, connecting with each other, you know, uh, back and forth, a, l a little brawl at the end. You had uh, the agents come out to separate. You had the shield coming out right back there. You had uh, Ziggler and Cena. These guys are workhorses. I mean, true workhorses. A great steel cage match. Uh, Eddie, where do you want to start? Eddie, how, what did you think of Raw? On a scale of 1 to 10, what would you give Raw? 7. Um, right off Seven. the bat. Yeah, um, for multiple reasons. Number 1. This is the 20th anniversary. This is a milestone anniversary. It's not 19, 18, 17, 21, 22, 23. This is a round number. Two decades of sports entertainment excellence on Monday nights. And I was hoping, personally, 
that they would have more of the flashback pre-recorded segments because they've had so many different stars come out of Monday Night Raw, built on Monday Night Raw. And I appreciated the ones that they did put up there. I appreciate the fact that they put some decent matches on the show. I mean, and think about it. For someone who says that his product ain't wrestling, it's sports entertainment, after 20 years and the anniversary show is almost said and done, what's the one thing they did? The good old-fashioned Saturday night pull-apart. You don't see much of the pull-apart anymore. You know, the pull-apart is something that when done right... It's beautiful. You don't even have to speak anything. You don't have to... You don't, no talking. No talking. Just go out there and have guys just beat the crap out of each other. You know, they run back and forth. You know, we can't get them, get them apart. Great stuff. Great stuff overall. I'm actually going to give them an 8 out of 10. This was... a. Uh, on what they had from the past show, good stuff. They had a lot of nostalgia, and we all knew that, that what, that's what this was about, really, was uh, the 20th anniversary. It says it right there in the title. I did like the beginning, when they had all the entrance music, all, all the yep. beginning intro music's right there. Just good stuff, good stuff all around. Uh, they took their time with it, as they tend to do with their own products. I mean, this was very well done. Unlike the NWO was done on WWE, but that's neither here nor yeah. there. Uh, I, you know, I was waiting for, I was actually waiting for the coffin of Chris Benoit uh, to come to come across somehow. Like, oh, look, it's Chris Benoit. Hey, everybody. It's a child killer. I want to give a big shout-out to everybody listening right now. Uh, the Stove, personal friend of the show, is the Stove listening tonight. I know she's not a wrestling fan, but she, she does like the show. She enjoys our sense of humor. To Jim Diva, to uh, iHeart Wrestling. To Matt Denton, to everybody listening tonight all around the world, I know uh, neither here nor there, there will be in England. One thing that connects us all is wrestling fans. And what you had was John Cena. What you had was Dolph Ziggler going out there and just laying it all on the line. What you had was the tag team titles relevant again. I mean, it's going to hate those titles. I think they're ugly as shit. <clears throat> Uh, the bronze or whatever it is, the Greco-Roman, it, you know, what, it doesn't look, it doesn't look well. It makes it seem like a bronze trophy. Oh, here's your third place trophy. Hey, wear this well. Uh, to see Kane and see his transition, you get to see some of those. Kane to me is one of the best big men of all time, and to see how he's come, uh, the Undertaker, those guys, some of those guys, you look at some old faces. There were some old faces on there. I love how they would break it up. You know the the gimmicks, etc., etc. But one thing I'm going to say: the steel cage match between Ziggler and Cena, because that's what we're going to focus on. Actually, uh, Eddie has got a soundbite for us to what was leading up to that. Eddie, if you will, hit us with the with the Cena bite. If got you it. Will. You got it. Try the other play button, Ding Dong. <laughs> It's wont to be a pain in the butt. Bear with me for just one second. Go to the red one. Recent history tonight is the 20th anniversary of Monday Night Raw. We should be talking about Austin, Rock, Kane, Taker, Game, Meat, HBK, Y2J, DOA, Hogan, Hall, Nash, Los Guerreros, Los Conquistadors, Batista, the Basham Brothers, Braden Walker. Wait, wait, wait. Braden Walker was never on Raw. Hell of a highlight reel, though. There you go. Recent history, forget about it. You want to waste time talking about my recent history? This is what's happened. I ate Fruity Pebbles, became invisible, became visible, got liked, got hated, posted, touted, tweeted, tooted, took a bowel movement the size of Papa Shango. Who cares? You should focus on the recent future. The recent future has me staring at Dolph Ziggler as hashtag gang of misfits in a steel cage. You listen. Three may be company in Jack Tripper's apartment, but that house out there belongs to me. And tonight, Dolph Ziggler will do exactly what World Wrestling Federation did to Monday Night Raw 10 years ago. And that is get the F out. Get the F out. Good stuff. <laughs> Say what you want to about Cena. As everyone hated on Hogan in the 80s. As everyone... Seemingly hated on everybody in the 90s, especially mm. Kevin Nash. There comes a point in time to where you have to put up or shut up. 
you see Zack Ryder. Zack Ryder, you know, uh, one of those guys that the, the internet wrestling community, as uh, I have been told that they like to be called, uh, they pushed this guy to the front. Like, oh, use him, use him. He fell flat on his face. Then you have somebody like Zack Ryder, who I believe was Mickey, Mikey. Which, which one was he from the from the Spirit Squad? Mm, God, any other time I could remember that. Anyway, so he goes through this, you know, him and Lenny Dykstra. I'm sorry, Kenny Dykstra were the only ones to uh, come out of that. Uh, Dykstra went on, did blah, 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 blah. Ziggler, <laughs> a man that has went out and worked his ass off, a man that has went out and shown time after time that if you work and if you pay your dues and if you go out, people will recognize. I mean, that was a great match, Eddie. Your Mickey. thoughts on that on that steel cage match? Nikki, by the way, had to remember for, um, for a minute, but it, actually, he was Nikki in the Spirit Squad. Uh, from that okay. vantage point, who told you? Nobody. Okay. I, I was flashing through to remember his real name is Nick Nemeth, so therefore he was Nikki. <laughs> yeah, see, yeah. So sorry, kids. Hated to do that, but I had to go ahead and I, I told the truth. Oh, shit. Here he goes again, telling that truth crap. Um, what do you think this is? Facebook? Uh, cage match. Well executed. Good start. Fast pace. I liked it. They um, The strategy that they put in place as far as you know the early part of it, um, I was wondering how long it was going to take before Big E Langston, which should be Big I Langston, which is short for I interfere every chance I get. Um, I'm just... I get sick and tired of outside interference. And the gimmick with the chair where he's trying to swat at Cena's feet, now that was almost funny. But yet you had to have somebody outside smack somebody on the inside with the door to the cage. It's a given. Why one can't do it to the other from, like Cena did to Ziggler. But other than that, I think the match was well done. These two guys laid it all out there. They kicked ass. Um, the fans were into it pretty much from start to finish. And then having AJ climb the cage, sit on the roof, not interfere, but still be visible, didn't detract any, from my opinion, it didn't take anything away from um, either Ziggler or Cena or even Langston in that regard. Wick? Big E. Big E is one of those guys that, uh, you know, he shouldn't be talking. I'm just going to say that. I'm just going to say that, but uh, I mean, I liked AJ climbing up the up the side of the cage as it should have been. She should have done something of of that nature, and and I love the fact that as soon as she went up there, Big E was right there. We have a caller six seven eight. Who do we have? Hey, this is Jonathan Williams. I'm calling a little early. Hey, Mr. Williams, how you doing tonight, sir? I'm doing all right. If you want to mute me until it's my time, that's fine. No, of course not. No. <laughs> okay. Well, I was really, just trying really to listen in for a little while. Oh, yes, sir. Really, really quick. Uh, we want to know, what What are your thoughts on, uh, did you get to catch Monday Night Raw? Uh, I know you do a radio show. Uh, yeah. Before the my George show airs now. an hour before Raw comes on, so I usually watch Raw. Right okay, after what are your I'm thoughts? My show. Um, on it being the 20th anniversary. Uh, well, yeah. we were talking mainly about the uh, about the Cena and Ziggler match. Um, I, from what I remember, it was a good match. It um, was disappointing to see Cena win, but <laughs> um, yeah, I thought it was a good match. I'm trying to remember specifics about it now. Ooh, the steel cage match where at the end you know, AJ come up, uh, Big E once again inserting himself into anything that they do. Uh, yeah. It was just one of those things that we were talking about, how Ziggler paid his dues and built up as it were, and how it should have been, how, how a guy has, has risen not to you know, pass what Zack Ryder has. Zack Ryder seemed to have hit a ceiling and stopped, and Ziggler just keeps going through. Well, I think a lot of that has to do with... Uh, his ability um, over someone like Zack Ryder. Zack Ryder has a has an entertaining gimmick and put himself over with his internet show and all that. But I think when it came down to what he could do as a U.S. champion or or just as something above a mid card wrestler, a lot of people felt like he uh, just wasn't ready for that. And uh, I think Dolph Ziggler. 
has a bit more charisma and is definitely a much better uh, athlete and better wrestler. So I think he's well deserving of of everything he's getting. I'm curious to see what's going to happen. They've actually hinted at it. I think last week on main event, it may have been that if he wins the Royal Rumble, he'll have a shot at both both titles. And I think it'd be great to see him be the third, the next Chris Jericho to to be the undisputed champion. I don't know if that's anything that might ever happen again, but it's certainly something to think about. Oh, there you go. You're talking about an undisputed champion. Hmm. It's been a while since we had a little undisputed champion. So, uh, but l- let me ask you this also. Uh, you know, you do a lot with wrestling journalism and a lot with other promotions uh, throughout a lot of independent promotions. Is there something that you see uh, on the independent promotions that you're a part of that seems to be stolen because a lot of people are like, oh, they're stealing from TNA, they're stealing from WWE. Is there something that you've been seeing recently that you're like, yeah, that's going to be on TV very, very soon? Um, I would, I guess, I think what you're asking, um, the invasion angle thing was something that was going on and still is going on to some degree throughout Georgia. Um, and for a while, it was in almost every promotion. Anarchy had Jerry Palmer's return and the Elite kind of taken over up there and ECW had the Empire and Rampage now has the Blacklist and um, they're all doing different things with it but it just seems like a, uh, you know, it goes back to the NWO and I'm sure there were things before that but that's the probably the biggest one that ever really felt like someone was taking over a company and it seems like that's just a big trend in the indies over the past that's a two years um i'm not sure if that's what you were kind of getting at but well yeah you know, remember thinking, sort of to that yeah i remember thinking that you know the first the first i remember was when empire uh started its takeover of ECW and then uh, MGCW at the time did a similar thing around the same time when they were changing to NWA action and I don't know how that played out there but they've since changed names yet again but still have two different titles and PCW still has two titles currently held by one person Um, but yeah I mean that would be the biggest thing that I've seen indie promotions do that seems like they're borrowing heavily from what the bigger companies have done in the past. Well, if you remember there at one time, uh, PCW was invaded like 17 times. Uh, <coughs> PCW, uh, yeah. it, well, you know, in October of 2010, uh, or was it no, September 2010 when they had Sacred Ground, uh, myself, Andrew Pendleton III, uh, Strict Nine and Danny Only come in. Of course, they were the hate junkies at the time. I come with Andrew Pendleton the third for the little battle royal. Well, that next masquerade show in October, we quote unquote invaded uh, PCW as the Prophets of Doom. You were there when we were the POD, yeah. and uh, it was alluded to because uh, Jerry Palmer was there. It was alluded to co- sort of as it was with the end of that we were invading from Anarchy. Because Stephen Platinum had been very open about his dislike for the NWA and for what Anarchy was doing in general, you know, Anarchy really wasn't yeah. giving a job to any of those guys from PCW. Kind of looked at those PCW guys as the bastard childs, Bast- bastard children, if you will, <laughs> childs. So I dusted right. for a second. I do apologize, but uh, and then right after that, uh, MGCW invaded for the first time. Uh, that went over yeah. like a fart in church. And then right after that well, is whenever like the Empire stuff happened, and then they were invaded such and such, and then such and such, and then it was just contagious. But I think that goes back uh, to the whole, you know, uh, when you have a, a, a hill faction, when you have a group of hills uh, of a like mind, I think that's what a tendency seems uh, to be doing. Uh, but but you're part of something very particular that we're actually going to talk about right after our first break of the evening, but we want to hit at it. Monstrosity Championship Wrestling, sir. If you can, in, in one word, can you encapsulate 
what this represents, sir? Um, absurdity. <laughs> <laughs> if it has to be one word. Well, I heard that Shane Knowles got his mind blown up there uh, going to one of the shows. So Shane Knowles was there. Oh, speaking of, that's another invasion uh, that you were part of. And oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think your six months is up, isn't it? Oh, yeah. My six months were yeah. up uh, January 2nd or something like that. January 6th, something. But come on, you know yeah, they're well, not going to let me back up there. You know they're not going to let me back <laughs> up there, sir. Well, I mean... December, December 6th, I'm being told. December 6th it was up. But, I mean, you you were there. You were there during the heat and stuff. They didn't really want that. Uh, that was a real invasion right there because none of us like Mike Jackson. They took everybody in that locker room that really despised Mike Jackson, that was very vocal against Mike Jackson, and put them against Mike Jackson. Everybody that yeah. everybody that was really a veteran, because the rest of those guys, you know, were kind of really green guys. I mean, uh, the the hill, the true veteran hills were all with me, and that's you know kind mm-hmm. of what what that fell into. Uh, hell, Eddie was there. We we were all there. We all witnessed that. But but the invasion is something that I think when done right. The only one that has been done the correct way, uh, maybe so the NWO started off the right way, and then all of a sudden they were like, well, it got too big. All of a sudden it was like, well, we're going to pull here, we're going to pull there, and then Buff was in it, and then Buff was out, and then Buff was in it again, and then Scott Steiner was in it, and then you had Virgil in it, and then uh, uh, Dipshit was in it, what's his name, uh, uh, Brutus the Bar Beefcake was in it, just all of a sudden, you know, but uh, I think Empire was a pretty good, uh, one of the best indie ones that they had. I mean, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they had Pandora, for God's sakes, in there at one time, so. <laughs> and I've said... Yeah. And uh, it, it, the Empire is still is still there. I mean, they technically lost at Sacred Ground, Chapter 3, but um, Shane Marks is the PCW and Empire champion, and he has taken the Empire to other, to other promotions, such as uh, UIW and in WA Atlanta, and I think he and the Jagged Edge, under the name Empire, are working up in uh, deep, uh, deep Southern Championship Wrestling. Oh, yeah. yes. so, yep. Yep. so it is. Uh, I would agree. It it was done the best, the best way I've seen an Invasion Eagle done, and it continues uh, in different ways. Well, I think Jagged Edge being a. Uh, as smart as he is to think, and you know, in uh, Georgia, your Georgia wrestling history's manager of the year for 2012, Jeff Bailey, also because uh, especially like in UIW, the tendency is to let it get out of hand when you have that many hills running around, you know, because you know if you have Empire at one promotion, Empire at another, if they lose here but they win over here, you're like, well. They lost to this crappy tag team over here. So if they turn around and beat everybody's asses over here, yeah, but they still lost to this backyard team over there. That, that's the only problem with it, and they've done a pretty good job with that. Like me, I refuse to let the MOD name out there. I was very against MOD being used at Peach State. I wanted to keep it the tribulation, but yeah, they were against it. Were, you were there that night that all that went down, were you not? I was there for uh, several shows. Uh, you and I actually had a, a slight confrontation in the ring. <laughs> um, I just got caught up in the middle of it, but um, yeah, I was there for uh, probably three or four uh, after the the show with the the belt match that got out of hand or oh, the strap yeah. match. Um, I was not there for that one, but I think I was at probably the the three or four that came after that. Up until so you're the you get arrest um, is what you're saying. I saw you get arrested. I saw, I saw the uh, was it the exotic one that stole Joey Kidman's car that he won. Um, I forget. <laughs> or was that you guys? No, that one. No, we didn't do that. That was great, though. Okay. Well, I was there when when the big cage match went down, where Mike Jackson almost fell off the top of it, and. Um, oh, no. I was fingers crossed he was going to fall and break his neck. I didn't want him to die. I just wanted to be a quadriplegic. I'm just being honest. Well, God. He was he was pretty close to it. I mean, I think, I don't know how many people even saw that, but I, you know, it seemed like there was so much going on in the ring and in the cage 
a lot of people were focused on other things, but uh, Matt Hankins and I were sitting there watching, and we both thought, oh, he's, he's about to, oh, good, he didn't. <laughs> I love the fact that he told everybody backstage, if nobody get color too early, he got color like two minutes into the match. Like, what the fuck are you doing, Mike? You stupid <laughs> fucking bastard. But uh, I loved Peach State. Peach State had great fans. They had a great, great aura, if you will. But uh, after the break, which we're about to take our first break of the evening, ladies and gentlemen, we're live with Wrestling with Pop Culture's own Jonathan Williams, also of Georgia Wrestling History and Georgia Wrestling Now Infamy. So we're going to go ahead and take our first break of the evening. When we come back, we're going to talk to Jonathan a little bit more. We're going to discuss the array, the aura that is wrestling with pop culture and all that it encapsulates. We're also going to discuss, yes, the cult favorite. We're all about cults on here, evidently. We've got Smart Rage's fat ass on here. And also we have wrestling with pop culture and, of course, Monstrosity Championship Wrestling. This is the To Be, the to be Determined show on the Beyond Ringside Wrestling Radio Network. Is that where we're going with, Eddie? Uh, Beyond Ringside Radio Network works. There you go. Beyond Ringside Radio Network. Don't change that URL, folks. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the To Be Determined show right here on Beyond Ringside Radio Network. This is the Oracle of Ominous, the architect of intellect, the wicked nemesis, and of course being joined by my co-host, the Magic City Motormouth, Fast Eddie Lane, and our guest tonight, Wrestling with Pop Culture's own, Jonathan Williams. Now, before we get to uh, Wrestling with Pop Culture and, and back with Jonathan, we asked everyone what was their favorite Raw moment of the last 20 years. Uh, Daryl B., said The Rock and Austin fighting over the Smoke and Skull title when the belt went off the bridge. That was a good one. When he took it and uh, threw it over, that was that, that was actually a really good moment. I think that's one of the better moments. Uh, Jonathan, what's your favorite Raw moment of the last 20 years? Um, hmm. Well, this, uh, this one happened here in Atlanta. I believe it was Raw just a few years ago. Um, and it may not be my favorite, but it's what's coming to mind at the moment. And it was when uh, Edge was started the show on top of a ladder, I believe, a really tall ladder. And he and Cena had a big match coming up. And uh, at one point, he jumped off the ladder, and Cena caught him. And I don't think even backpedaled or took any steps backwards. He just caught Edge, who's not a small guy, and stood there in the ring. And I, I don't know, that was impressive to me that, I mean, clearly John Cena's a very strong guy, but that was a, an impressive display of his strength. Um, but there's a lot of a lot of moments. I mean, I guess the Attitude Era was probably when Raw was at its peak, so there, there's plenty, plenty to pull from there. But uh, I also like the Spirit Squad quite a bit. I know a lot of people didn't like them, but I thought they had some funny moments, and I can't remember what was on Raw and SmackDown and whatever, but I thought they were always fun to watch on there. Eddie, what is your favorite Raw over the last 20 years? Four, actually. One, Austin Tyson. Two, Austin in the beer bath. Three, anything having to do with the APA. (laughs) And the unholy marriage where Stephanie McMahon was supposed to get married to The Undertaker. I thought that was one of the most, um, even though it was a knockoff of somebody else, I think it was a very brilliantly written segment. Uh, my favorite moment. <clears throat> uh, actually, I, I have two, uh, really, but the one that stands out the most, of course, is whenever it was the the last Monday Nitro, when Raw and Nitro were being played at the same time, and you had Vince McMahon in a Raw ring, and then you had Shane McMahon in a WCW ring. I thought that was awesome. I never thought I'd see anything like that uh, for Vince to buy them out was just something. And, of course, the one that stands out, uh, not my favorite, but uh, the one that's most tragic is uh, when Benoit uh, committed his senseless act of violence. And Raw started off with no fans, an empty ring, and Vince standing there. Uh, To me, those are the two moments that stand out the most to me. Uh, Ask my son his favorite moment, 
and uh, he said his favorite ma- his favorite Raw moment, of course, was Eric Bischoff coming to WWE. I thought that was pretty funny. But, uh, I mean, everybody has the Raw moments. We saw a bunch of them. But we're going to ask really quick because, you know, uh, WWE is really sports entertainment. And there's nobody better to talk about sports entertainment than the man whose entire website is dedicated to just that, sports and entertainment combining to make sports entertainment. Jonathan Williams, you do so much on Wrestle with Pop Culture. If you will, tell everyone uh, how did Wrestle with Pop Culture start and uh, what is it all about, sir? Uh, it came about um, almost two years ago now. March will be the second anniversary. And I was, uh, prior to that, I was employed as a freelance journalist uh, for the Atlanta Journal Constitution was somewhere that I got a lot of work. Creative Loafing, who I still write for. Um, I've done some stuff for Pro Wrestling Illustrated and um, various other publications. I, I still write an art column for uh, in Atlanta monthly called Stomp and Stammer. And, uh, but anyway, I was doing that full time, and then a few years ago when the economy kind of went downhill. And print publications started, you know, going through hard times. I suddenly found myself not getting as much freelance work, but I still had the the contacts in various industries, music, wrestling, um, movies, comic books, whatever. I still was getting stuff sent to me to review and things like that. So I came up with the, the idea to start, you know, a blog. Blogs were big, still are, but that was, you know, around the time that a lot of people were starting blogs. And uh, let's see, I the guy who drew the logo is a pretty famous artist named K.R.K. Ryden. He's uh, his brother's Mark Ryden, who's an even more famous pop surrealist. But uh, K.R.K. Ryden has done some stuff for Devo, and I guess that's what he's most known for. And I in a roundabout way became friends with him and I told him what I was thinking of doing and he just drew this logo up and sent it to me and I was like, well, that pretty much sums it up. There's like a luchador mask and sci-fi stuff and a robot and all these different things and basically everyone I know that's into pro wrestling is also into horror movies or MMA or comic books or just various other kinds of entertainment and it's the kind of thing that if you are kind of obsessive about wrestling like probably everyone on the line right now is then you probably have other things that you're just as into and so I just kind of went went in that direction and started uh, I was lucky enough that when the uh, when the website started it was right as right before Wrestlemania was here in Atlanta and I was still uh, actually, some of my last assignments for the AJC were WrestleMania articles, so I was doing stuff uh, for for AJC and Creative Loafing on all the WWE events, as well as Ring of Honor and Dragon Gate and everything else, ECW, all the other shows that were going on leading up to WrestleMania. So, basically, I was, I was taking any interview that I was offered by WWE or anyone else, and anything that I didn't use for AJC or Creative Loafing became content for my website. And then from there, I just started posting movie reviews and pretty much anything that I that I get or get to go to or have access to that I'm interested in. I figure there are other wrestling fans that are also interested in those same things, so I, uh, I just post, I update it several times a week and just keep it going. And I uh, I won the Reader's Choice Award for Best Local Blog and Creative Loafing for 2012. So I guess it has kind of caught on. Now, with all that being said, sir, uh, can you actually go to an event, to a wrestling event, and look at it uh, from a fan's point of view instead of instantly wanting to uh, to start to write about it and critique it and to uh, to instantly uh, uh, start to set up a review for it, sir? Yeah, actually, I, I try to to stay... I try to keep the, um, the, the fan perspective as, 
as much access as I'm allowed at certain certain venues and promotions and stuff and all that, I still prefer to not not know who's who's backstage, what's going to happen. I, I like to be able just to experience it along with everybody else, and and I still try to to approach it in that way. It's kind of like believing in Santa Claus or whatever. Of course, I know there's no Santa Claus, but I still really like how it felt when I thought there was a Santa Claus, and so that's sort of how I approach going to wrestling events. I try to stay as out of it as I can so that nothing is, so it's still a surprise and, and everything that happens is something that I'm not necessarily expecting to happen. Is there anybody that you're a fan of actually uh, seeing, uh, a fan that if you, oh my God, they're, they're at such and such promotion, I've got to go see them. Uh, on the local scene or indie scene? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's several. Um, my former co-host on Georgia Wrestling Now, Danny Only, Ian Strick Nine are two guys that I always enjoy seeing in the ring. Uh, Fred Yehi is another one um, who's branching out now. He is mostly known in PCW, but he's holds uh, the internet title at UIW now, I believe, and uh, who else is there? Pooh Jones and Sean Banks definitely are guys that are always entertaining. Um, Chip Day. Uh, there's plenty of others. Bobby Moore has become a guy that, surprisingly to some, I guess, has come a long way, it seems like, in the past year or so. Uh, I don't know. I could name plenty, plenty <laughs> of other people. <laughs> now, now Shane you're Marks, associated... Jagged Edge. Oh yes, the revelation, Shane Marks. Right. Uh, now you're really associated with a promotion called Monster Energy Championship Wrestling. Tell everyone, if you will, what is this about, sir? It is. Um, it is about monsters and real wrestlers doing battle in the ring, and uh, wrestling with pop culture is the I guess, a promoter for it, or like a sponsor. But it's really Professor Morte's thing. He, um, fans of the horror scene in here in Atlanta will know him. He hosts the Silver Screen Spook Show, which uh, used to be a monthly event at the Plaza Theater. And I think it's kind of taken a hiatus. But uh, he, he got into wrestling uh, a couple years ago. I believe it was October of 2011. Um, at the Atlanta Zombie Apocalypse, which is a, a zombie, I don't want to say haunted house, it's like an immersive attraction that's open throughout October, where zombies actually chase you through like an abandoned truck stop and stuff, and um, so that was where Monstrosity debuted as entertainment for the people waiting in line when it got busy the last couple weekends of October. They did two Saturdays there, and then they were at, uh, the very next time was actually last March at the Masquerade for the Wrestling with Pop Culture first anniversary, which was also an after party for the Atlanta Film Festival screening of The Booker, which is a documentary about Stephen Platinum and ECW. So uh, a lot of ECW wrestlers were involved because that was a venue where they normally run, but Professor Morte brought the monsters and we saw the Washington Bullets turn into zombies and Chip Day defeated uh, a guy known as Papa Marco who's the one who, who cast the spell and turns people into zombies and uh, Dragula, the, the gay vampire, took on the Alabama Wolfman who's an intolerant southern redneck werewolf. And a personal um, favorite of Danny Only's. <laughs> well, they kind of they kind of look alike. I heard Matt Stelz is a big fan of the Alabama Werewolf as well. Oh yeah, <laughs> Matt Sex uh, You got to call him by the got to call him by his God given name, Matt Sex Sells. I'm just saying. Yeah, well, I think Sex actually is his middle name. I think it is too. I think I think uh, they always put I'm it in quotation marks, but. <laughs> 
So anyway, that that event went well. There we had some bands play and some other festivities. But uh, when I saw how how far it had come and how well it was received, I wanted just to provide another venue for that for Monstrosity Championship Wrestling to happen again. And we were supposed to do a show again at Masquerade, and that didn't happen. But um, Monstrosity was at the Rock and Roll Monster Bash in June, which is a big event that happens every year at the Starlight Six Drive-In Theater, where it's during the day. It's a uh, it's a big music festival kind of thing, and there's a bunch of vendors and stuff. And then at night they show various horror movies from yesteryear, but this year they added Monstrosity Championship Wrestling to the mix, so in between bands there was wrestling, and uh, it was out in broad daylight uh, in front of a lot of people that don't normally go see independent wrestling, or wrestling at all for that matter, and um, it seemed, again, it was a lot of the same people from the Wrestling with Pop Culture Anniversary show, as well as many other people people that did not attend that event, and uh, it just, it seemed like it caught on, it seemed like, you know, people in Atlanta tend to not go outside of Atlanta for things, even if they're wrestling fans, a lot of them won't drive to Carrollton or Cornelia or Porterdale or Warner Robins or any of the other cities that have big wrestling shows, so to bring wrestling to them uh, seemed like a good idea, so... You know, I just got with Morte, and we came up with, uh, I guess we sort of just started trying to figure out where we could do it again, and we found a venue and did a show in November, and it went really well, but then that venue kind of shut down uh, temporarily, supposedly. So then we found a new venue and uh, did a show on January 4th at a place called The Asylum in East Atlanta, and... That is, for now, the new home for MCW. Um, the next show is February 9th, and then the second anniversary of Wrestling with Pop Culture show will be March 9th, and we'll be both of those will be at the Asylum. Well, that, that sounds fantastic. I, I, I love the fact you're bringing uh, different eyes, if you will, to wrestling. Bringing wrestling to people that, as you said, usually wouldn't even see wrestling at all, independent or mainstream. Fat City Lane, is there something that you would like to ask Mr. Williams? Actually, I'm pretty good on this side of the board because he's been, I mean, so many different projects going on. It's really kind of hard to pick one to focus on. Um, how many hats do you actually wear right now? And um, how hard is it to really get one that fits? <laughs> um, I think they all fit. They just, they're just very different hats sometimes. But in a lot of ways, wrestling with pop culture and monstrosity championship wrestling have become symbiotic and even before I was as involved with it as I am now um, after the first few shows people were emailing me about hey how can I get that monster wrestling thing at, at my whatever festival or whatever and I would just pass it on to the people that were actually putting the shows together um, but yeah I guess I still I still write for I still do freelance writing for other publications, but the majority of my creative energy is put into wrestling with pop culture, and then I kind of use that to help further Monstrosity Championship Wrestling. Thank you. And uh, I think those are the main hats that I wear that that would pertain to the wrestling community at least. Now, I'm going to take two words out of what you were saying earlier, and you mentioned two of my favorite words in the English vernacular. As someone who lived in Atlanta from 89 to 93 and still goes back over there to find a copy every chance he gets, creative loafing. When I first moved to Atlanta in 89, it was the underground counterculture that actually went both liberal and progressive, Democrat and Republican as far as its political views. It let everybody write for it. It, of course, had the underground scene as far as everything from pro wrestling itself all the way to the different nightclubs, especially like the Masquerade. And do have you seen, I mean, if you describe creative loafing to people right now outside of the metropolitan Atlanta area, how do you describe CL? Uh, well, it is 
it is still Atlanta's alternative weekly publication. A lot of people compare it to the Village Voice in New York or something like that, and I think it's changed a bit, um, mostly, again, because print publication overall has changed, so when you pick up a copy of Creative Loafing, it's much thinner than it used to be, but in turn, there's a lot more content online, which is a lot of what I do uh, for them now is just uh, online, uh, not always in print. So uh, especially you know, the wrestling stuff that I write about, they, they typically, from what I remember, have not covered pro wrestling all that much. But I've discovered over the past couple of years that's mostly because they don't have anybody on staff that really follows it or, more importantly, understands it. They get confused with, with pro wrestling and MMA and the whole is it real or not kind of stuff, and and people are kind of afraid to cover it because they think it's silly, but Jonathan, I get to... Yeah. We can settle that part right now. Everybody with an IQ above dried wallpaper paste knows professional wrestling is real. Mixed martial arts is fake. Of course. It's a work. Professor Morte has said that himself. <laughs> I would say it's fake. I say um, it's a work, but, uh, you know. It's a ballet. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, to sum up what Creative Loafing is, it is, uh, I would say now it's, it's more online, which means it's not just a weekly thing. It's something that, you know, they post new, new stories on a daily basis and they have, they have, uh, various different blogs under the Creative Loafing umbrella for music or for pop culture or for politics or restaurants or whatever you're into. Um, so that's that's what creative loafing is. Jonathan, what's your favorite horror movie of all time? Um, I would have to say it's between the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre and the first Nightmare on Elm Street. Yes. <laughs> but those are movies that came up came out within my lifetime. So there are plenty of older movies. Actually, Professor Morte is hosting the world premiere of the restored version of White Zombie, uh, oh. which is another one of my favorite it's horror films. Uh, mm-hmm. this, this Friday at the Plaza Theater. Um, and I'm not trying to... Well, yeah, it's kind of a cheap plug, but that is one of my favorite horror movies, which is why I think People should go see it because it's the world premiere of of the the new ver- not in remake. It's just the original version restored. And uh, for people who haven't seen it, it's I think it came out before Dracula. I might be wrong about that, but it, it stars Bela Lugosi, and he plays a, a voodoo guy that turns people into zombies, but not the undead zombies. They're under a voodoo spell kind of thing and uh, it's a great movie and Professor Morte is hosting that screening so I encourage that but yeah Texas Chainsaw Master and Nightmare on Elm Street are probably my two favorites now how can everyone get in touch with you sir and what do you have upcoming with Wrestling With Pop Culture uh, if you go to WrestlingWithPopCulture.com there's a contact page that goes directly to me uh, or you can email me at jw at wrestlingwithpopculture.com. Uh, on Twitter, I am at WrestlePopCulter, C-U-L-T-R, as I ran out of letters or ran out of space. Uh, on Facebook, there's a Wrestling With Pop Culture page and a Monstrosity Championship Wrestling page. Um, and what's next for Wrestling With Pop Culture? Uh... I'm always posting new stuff. I have a few, let's see, movies that I've seen uh, that I'll be posting reviews of this week. Mama, the new horror movie. That's Guillermo. Guillermo del Toro presents, which means he really didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> his name on it. Well, that means that um, he was the one that was like, hey, everybody, look. This is a great movie. Look at this. Right. Yeah, I guess that's sort of like being a producer, though, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's exactly what it is. 
Um, so that review will be up this week. Um, i got various other uh, interviews. I'm supposed to be interviewing Anti-Scene or Jeff Clayton from the band Anti-Scene. I imagine you're probably familiar with them. Uh, not, Danny only. Danny only has told me about them. I'm not, yes, yeah. uh, I'm sure Danny only is a big fan. But they, uh, he is a big wrestling fan, and they actually just put out a CD a few months, a couple months ago, that is a collection of all the wrestling songs they've ever done. So they've done enough awesome. songs about wrestling to make. I think it's like a 12 song album over the years. Um, so there's always. Lots of new content on there. And like I said, March 9th will be the second anniversary party for Wrestling with Pop Culture. So we'll be at the Asylum, which is which is a bar, uh, which means people can drink and have fun, and there's a band. And it's a, it's a very different atmosphere from most indie wrestling promotions. And um, But I think that is a good thing. I think that attracts, like I said before, it brings people out that may not, go see an indie wrestling show where you can only buy hot chocolate and a hot dog or whatever. But and that's not for to, the fans. To, and that's yeah. for the fans. Don't, don't, not, the talent, don't the talent go get shit-faced drunk and try to go and do some shit. No. That is forbidden. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, but I'm not trying to, to disparage other indie promotions in any sense. I'm just saying that's one of the things that's set it apart. And actually, I believe, uh, Eddie, you're involved with GCW, aren't you? Uh, Global Championship Wrestling, yes. Yeah, I enjoy that. I, I watch it on, on your website uh, whenever new new episodes are posted. Cool, thank you. We appreciate yeah, it. Looks, looks like a fun show. I know you've been doing some shows in Canton or something over the past few months, but I haven't made it out to any of those yet. Yeah, unfortunately, we're not quite sure about the future for, um, for us in Canton right now, but we're taking everything one day at a time. Cool. Well, I've seen some kind of monstrous gimmicks there that <laughs> might might want to might want to borrow. <laughs> That's for great. Morte might Morte might speak them out. Well, Jonathan, we appreciate you coming on, ladies and gentlemen. This has been wrestling with pop culture's own. Jonathan Williams, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to take our second break of the evening right here on the To Be Determined show. Do not change that URL when we come back. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, it's time to feel the rage. The internet wrestling community's darling, the cult favorite, speaking of culture, <laughs> the cult favorite, Smart Rage. Feel the rage right here on the To Be Determined show. Now that's good music right there. That's great music. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the To Be Determined show right here on its new home, part of the Beyond Ringside Radio Network, beyondringside.com. Ladies and gentlemen, we were joined shortly by by Corey, but we want to, we still got Jonathan Williams on the phone, and with everything, you know, we, we were pulling him left to right. Jonathan uh, didn't get a chance to say something. Jonathan, Something big's happening uh, for Monster Rossi Championship Wrestling March 9th. What is it, sir? Uh, that will be the crowning of the first MCW champions. And yes. um, I believe you're going to have Professor Morte on next week, so he can uh, he can answer a lot more questions about the specifics of who's involved with Monster Rossi Championship Wrestling. But I can tell you uh, the, the tournament started on January 4th, with, uh, let's see, Fred Yehi took on Strict Nine, which is a first-time-ever match between those two guys. Uh, and Yehi won the match, so he advances. Um, Supernatural and Mason wrestled, and Supernatural came out on top there. Uh, let's see, who else was there? The Phantom and Chip Day put on a great match. 
with the Phantom advancing, and Papa Marco took on Crew Jones, who was making his NCW debut. And because of the uh, Crew Jones voodoo doll that was being yes. employed or being used by uh, by Mambo Monet, who is Papa Marco's sidekick, I guess, uh, Crew eventually left the match and got counted out because she was putting that needle in an area he didn't want to be stabbed. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe um, she's the enchantress. I think is what she's is what she is. But yes, now uh, now I have seen the infamous voodoo doll now. Now, uh, yeah, it was go to hotlinelava.com. Oh, it, it's crazy. Yeah. It looks real. Yeah. So first, uh, they realized they could take away his rooster crow, which was kind of uh, scaring away the zombies, uh, so she would stab him in the neck, and he couldn't do the rooster crow. Then she aimed a little lower, and she said, forget this, and left the ring. So that is the... The fi- the finals, or the next round of the tournament, will be February 9th, where we'll see Fred Yehi take on the Phantom, Papa Marco take on Supernatural, and then the winners of those two matches will will do battle in the main event on March 9th at the Wrestling with Pop Culture anniversary show. And the winner of that match will become the first MCW champion. You heard it right here. The first champion so congratulations to all those that were a part of that tournament i know every single one of those guys in that tournament and let me say those are some of the best young talent with exception of crew because crew is about my age but you know <laughs> let, let's just say what it is crew jones is a phenomenal athlete period but you have a lot of young hungry guys in monster Ice championship wrestling as well as the surrounding area of atlanta and somebody that knows all about that, we have on the line right now. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to not take any more time away from him. It is the ICW, the Internet, or IWC, sorry, I fucked that up. <laughs> Internet Wrestling Community's own, the Internet darling, uh, Corey Smark Rage, with his segment that we call the Smarks Rage. Corey, what are you raging about this week? What's going on, folks? Thank you for having me. Uh, make sure, first of all, if you're in Atlanta, check out Monstrosity Championship Wrestling. Uh, make sure you check out my good buddy Jonathan Williams' West website, wrestlingwithpopculture.com. Phenomenal website, movie reviews, wrestling reviews. Check it out. Now to on, now to on, onto the rage. So, uh, so this week, instead of me raging, I turned to Twitter and asked some of my followers what were some of the things. That pissed them off. And Alicia from Atlanta, who you can find her on Twitter, at AliDoll4042. Uh, 42, yes. Uh, her, her rage is storylines that start out real, real good, real, real hot, and then fizzle out with absolutely no direction or no definitive ending. And one thing that really comes to mind to for me like that is... When Samoa Joe was kidnapped and was off TV for months, and I know this is two years ago, okay, and then all of a sudden he just appeared back with no, you know, they never tied up that storyline. They just ended it. It leaves the fans confused, you know. I think <laughs> it, it, Samoa Joe confused. <laughs> so, there's Samoa Joe even in TNA still? Well, that's the problem is right after that is when his push completely stopped. But, you know, you were talking about something. The NWO did the same thing. That's not having a payoff. That is one of the worst things about professional wrestling is storylines slash angles that don't have a payoff. Or the payoff is not as good as the start. Uh, there are some guys like Al Snow. Uh, myself, when I booked, uh, I always started off with the finish and then worked your way backwards. That's because that's what you have to have. The main thing about it is the payoff. You can have a shitty start to something and gradually build to it, but that payoff is what it's all about. That's why it's the payoff is what you make the money off of. Corey, continue, sir. You know, uh, another thing that uh, another Twitter fo- a Twitter follower just at just fucking ride is that there's no level structure in the uh, like there was in the past, like in the mid cards. It's just main event guys, and if you fall to the wayside, you fall to the wayside. Go back and look. At uh, Zack Ryder last year, he won the um, he won the U.S. title. Finally, won 
won the U.S. title, and he held it for a month, and then he went back to just be, being that you know poor little schmucky Zack Ryder uh, that that doesn't he doesn't he doesn't even have a YouTube show anymore. You know, either do something with these mid car guys, or or you know, or let them go. Yeah, Hold on, you just talent. said that there was no structure to the. Or I'm sorry, when your followers said that there was no structure to the mid card, then instantly you said, "You need to do something with these mid card guys or let them go." There's a mid card, everybody. I think that's a casual fan. There is definitely a mid card, not in TNA. There's absolutely no mid card in TNA because they can't decide whether they want to somebody to have momentum or they want them to stop. Ladies and gentlemen, enhancement talent is enhancement talent. Yep. Some of the best workers in the world, some of the best wrestlers in the world, are enhancement talent. They are used to go out there and make somebody like Goldberg or make somebody like uh, uh, Big Big Langston, whatever the shit, Eli E, whatever the hell. Guys like that, they really can't go more than you know, 10, 12 minutes. That's what they were there for. I hate to tell everybody this, but Fit Finley and Lord Steven Regal at the time – were beaten by Goldberg pretty handedly, even though both of them legitimately beat the shit out of him in the ring. Uh, I think that you know there, there is a mid card, just not in TNA, and definitely not in Ring of Honor. TNA, Ring of Honor, no. WWE definitely has their quote unquote mid card. How do you feel about that, Corey? Do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with it, but again, to make a educated guess, I don't watch the TNA product because um, I go to bed early on Thursday nights. That's because you work like fifteen hours in a row. So, well, right that that too, and and fifteen cheeseburgers in a row. Uh, <laughs> the next thing, <laughs> my, my good friend uh, Scott Fishman at at SM Fishman from uh, the Miami Herald covers sports wrestling in the Miami Herald. Talked about the pay per view prices. You know, I don't mind paying for a a a forty five dollar pay per view if the pay per view is worth it. You know, uh, recently. The pay per views have been have been subpar. I know that myself and a group of people, including uh, Jonathan Williams, we all go hang out at Buffalo Wild Wings and you know watch the pay per view for free. And you know it, it doesn't cost. I know it doesn't cost me, but about twenty bucks to see a fifty dollar pay per view. Uh, Do you wh- tip wh- your waitress? Uh, well, I put it all in, not just the tip. Oh. That's- that's what she I'm said. I'm taking but a minute anyways, off yeah. for that. <laughs> Corey, go ahead, man. But, you, you know, the pay-per-view prices, they're outrageous. It's $55 for an HD pay-per-view, $45 for a regular pay-per-view. And, and at times, the pay-per-view is not worth is not worth 10 or $15. Now, I know I went uh, a few months ago to watch uh, one of the TNA pay-per-views at the movie theater, paid 20 bucks, fantastic time, great pay-per-view. It's just, you know, sometimes the pay-per-view is just not worth the price of admission. What do you guys think? Absolutely not. I haven't, yes, uh, pay-per-views uh, have grown exponentially worse as well as the product. But that goes back to WWE not having a real rival. Uh, every once in a while, they'll have a great pay-per-view. And then you're like, that was a great pay-per-view. But you're having, what, 13, 14 pay-per-views? One out of 14? I don't even think Meatloaf could write a decent song about that. Uh, real quick, if See, I See, Jonathan could... laughed. Jonathan laughed because he's a little old school. He understands that joke. Well, here's something. Well, I think, uh, I'm sorry, so I think somebody else is trying to talk to you. Go ahead, Jonathan. Go ahead. I was just going to say TNA, I think, I think it was a good move on TNA's part to uh, cut back on the pay-per-views. I think they're only doing four, and then they're doing these other tapings on pay-per-view weekends that will be cheaper pay-per-views or something. Yeah, but um, well, the, the, the only problem about that is that they did uh, they did TV tapings for April. It's now January. I know what's going to happen in April. So, you know, by them doing that, that winds up killing their product in the end. So, you want to know what that? Joker's Wild, that's when the Joker's Wild tag team tournament and the X Division thing are going to air in April. Yes, you know why? Why would I want to know what's what's going to go on in April now? And then you expect me to invest time in in your product? Uh, that is a little what? crazy. St- step it up, TNA. Step it up, uh, WWE. Folks, make sure you check out if you're in Atlanta. Check out Monstrosity Championship Wrestling. 
find me on Twitter at SparkRage, Facebook.com forward slash The Smarks Rage, Jonathan Williams, Wrestling Pop com. That's my time. That's my rage. Corey, I'm Corey, out before of you get, Corey, before you get out, what's your favorite moment of Raw in the last 20 years? My favorite moment of Raw in the last 20 years was when Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels made amends. And that's his that rage, and he's recent. sticking to it. It's my time, and that's like my to, rage. Could I amend my favorite moment? No. Sure, go right ahead. There's Shut actually, up. No amendments. Actually, actually, I just want to add to your favorite moment, Enoch, when uh, the, the last Nitro, there's a specific part of that where uh, Vincent Mann was watching a monitor of what was going on at the Nitro show, and Dustin Rhodes, I believe he was going under Dustin Rhodes or maybe Dustin Reynolds at the time, but he appeared on screen and he started making fun of him about when he had been in WWE as Gold Dust and saying he wanted breast implants and this and that, and I thought that was really funny. <laughs> that, that entire night was just crazy, but uh, uh, that, that was one of those moments in that night. But, Corey, thank you so much, sir. We will see you next week. Check out the Facebook fan page of The Smarks Rage. Corey, thank you, sir. You guys have a wonderful night. Make sure you check out WrestlingPopCulture.com. Check it out. Poof. Thanks, Corey. <laughs> it's like Puff the Magic Dragon. He's gone. Yeah, I didn't have the heart to play what I was going to play. I decided not to. Uh, I, I uh, no, yeah, done- yeah. We were going to mess with Corey. Uh, we give Corey seven minutes because if you let Corey wonder, he'll wonder, he'll, he'll wonder around... Like like a guy with Parkinson's disease in a China shop. So you know you got to watch out with Corey. I love Michael J. Fox, so that was not don't no get all Rush Limbaugh on me. Uh, well, by the same token, hold on. Breaking news: Smart Rage can kill sixteen cheeseburgers at one time. Actually, I was about to do my Ted Koppel voice. Damn it! You tease me with that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, butt wheat has been shot. Newsflash, buckwheat is still dead. (laughs) Oh, Joe Piscopo, that was good stuff. I was originally going to break that out for breaking snooze as Denton uh, gave it to us over on BR, but I decided, you know, we had that one and it's just like, let's run with it. We can have fun all the way up and down the network. But, gentlemen, we talked about this off air and I want to get everyone's thoughts on it. (laughs) You know, we kid Hogan all the time. A lot of us aren't big Hogan fans anymore. Or, you know, uh, kind of don't like how things have went uh, at this point in his career. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Hulk Hogan has filed a lawsuit against the Tampa-based Laser Spine Institute saying that the clinic did unnecessary surgeries that ultimately damaged his career. Uh, it was the Tampa Bay Times that reported Hogan filed the lawsuit uh, this past Monday. He filed under his real name, which is Terry Bollea, and it seeks damages of $50 million. Uh, in addition to claiming unnecessary surgeries, the lawsuit also says the Laser Spine Institute used an endorsement from Hogan without permission or payment. Uh, the Laser Spine Institute said it is aware of the lawsuit, but to protect patient privacy, it does not want to discuss details of the case. So, uh, any, uh, you know, with everything we, we talked about, this uh, local hero, local villain, if you want to. I mean, the guy's a legend in the South, Doug Summers, pretty boy Doug Summers. Yep. Uh, we actually interviewed him uh, in the incarnation that was Shoot Finish. Uh, Doug Summers, I wrote a review for Beyond Ringside and for uh, PW 24 7. Uh, when he wrestled, one of his his last weekend that he wrestled, he wrestled at that Friday night at what was that part an NWA affiliate out of Piedmont, Alabama, and then he wrestled uh, in Carrollton, Georgia, I believe, the following night. Doug could barely get around. Doug could barely get in the ring. Uh, Brian Alexander punched Doug Summers in the face and knocked his dentures out. I mean, it was just, Doug was just in so much, I mean, he could barely get around. This is a guy that had paid his dues and had left everything literally in the ring. And that's what uh, what Hogan has done. 
Hogan, you know, his uh, 30 seconds into his training, had his ankle snapped just to see if he uh, wanted to stay in the business, if he truly wanted to do this. The man has, what, 42 hip surgeries? He's had dozens upon dozens of knee surgeries on each knee. And uh, his back injury or his back surgeries are uh, something of legend, if you will. Uh, We all know TMZ has, uh, since everything happened with the reality show Hogan Knows Best, TMZ latched on to the Hogan family and their exploits and every single thing they've done has kind of been out in the open since then. Uh, Do you think, Jonathan, that... uh, that Hogan should bring up this lawsuit because what he's saying is that they were performing surgeries that he didn't necessarily uh, need. Um, I don't, I don't know a whole lot of. I don't know. No, these are just our opinions. Now, now, really quick, you know, these are just our opinions. We're just asking. Uh, we've all seen Hogan uh, throughout our career. We're all wrestling fans. Uh, we're just, we're just asking this out there. This is just our opinion and our opinion. Alone, we're not medical doctors. I do have a PhD. Right. I do have a PhD in uh, in this in the finer arts. But uh, go ahead, Jonathan. Well, I was just going to say I don't know the specifics of the particular surgery he's referencing. Um, I think it's been clear for a long time that he's his, his career as a wrestler um, was was over. A while back, and I and I think that probably was because of some physical ailments. And I know he's had many surgeries, like you said, but I don't know which surgeries did what and which one he is blaming for um, shortening his career. So it's hard to say, but I guess just given how many surgeries he's had and other his clear clear physical limitations. As we saw the last time, I believe it was his last match, was at that Bound for Glory that we talked about off the air with Sting. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I guess I don't think the lawsuit is necessary. I think he should just kind of do what he's done since that match, and if he wants to stay in wrestling, just do it in a different capacity, not as a wrestler. Uh, the exact surgery that he's talking about is in 2009. Uh, he said he went to the Institute for Treatment for Scoliosis and for Bulging Disc, which uh, everybody knows Hogan and a lot of guys his size uh, suffer from bulging disc from their backs, you know, from take bees like that. Uh, he said, but the operations he received left him feeling worse. And eventually he had to go major back surgery, which we all saw when he was down not too long ago. Uh, with a surgery with a different set of doctors. Uh, the alleged bot surgeries caused Hogan to miss several employment opportunities in wrestling and acting that could have earned him at least $50 million. And that is where he uh, come up with the, the number for that, uh, for that $50 million. It also says, <clears throat> excuse me, that Hogan became aware of the potential for a lawsuit after reading a Bloomberg report in 2011 that cited many other lawsuits against the Laser Spine Institute and other spine doctors. So it appears that Hogan, holy shit, there are pictures of Hogan's back after he had that surgery, his surgical scars. Oh my God. Uh, we're all adults here. Uh, for those that have ever seen the women that have uh, that like to have their backs uh, with the hooks picked in and picked up off the ground, Hogan's yeah. back surgery looks a thousand times worse than that. Uh, anybody can Google Hogan surgery, and the images are just holy shit. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eleven hooks in his back, holes in his back, and one straight down the spine. It is unbelievable. So, I mean, <laughs> he may actually have a lawsuit with this. Uh, for anybody that wants to check this out, the LA Times wrote a great article, and of course, uh, the Orlando Sentinel is is on top of this, but uh, and really quick before. Well, given, we... mm-hmm. Go ahead, sir. Given the, those specifics, I'm trying to think back now. If he when it when it was that it was became clear that he could no longer wrestle. Yeah, I, I don't remember if it was pre 2009 or not. But I mean, if he was down long enough to lose bookings and 
acting gigs and stuff, then sure, he should he should try to get some of that money back because we all know how much money he lost in the divorce and everything because that was made so public. Well, uh, in 2006, he actually uh, worked a little bit in WWE. I believe that's when his match with uh, Shawn Michaels happened. Uh, he also said yeah. it cost him a major match with John Cena, which was supposed to be uh, one of his matches that uh, was like his turning point, I guess. And he said the payday would have been one of the biggest paydays of all time for him. So, I mean, <sighs> there you go. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I know it's a sour note, but we're about to take our last break of the evening. When we come back, we're going to talk about something very near and dear to Jonathan and to Eddie and to my heart, the independent scene. Don't change that URL. This is the To Be Determined show right here on Beyond Ringside Radio Network. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the take it home portion of the show, the last segment of the evening. Thank you all for joining us tonight on the To Be Determined show. We're on the line still with Wrestling With Pop Cultures, Jonathan Williams, and with the Magic City Motormouth, my co-host, Fast Eddie Lane. Woo-hoo. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the portion of the show where we talk about the independent scene, where we talk about the grassroots, if you will, the tea party. In some cases, oh God, here comes the gun talk. Um, that was a little political joke for everybody. Everybody's like, what? <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, you saw what I posted on Facebook today, huh? No, I didn't. What'd you say? Oh boy, you went off, didn't you? Uh, actually, believe it or not, for me, a lot of people would consider it going off. But you know me, I'm not going to be politically correct. However, I am going to be diplomatic. And bas- diplomatic immunity. Yeah, that's what I should have right about now, even though I basically called everybody up on the Hill um, dweebs, morons, and idiots, and gave the equivalent of, if you really want to try to take any more of my money, you can kiss my ass. No, he didn't. Clarence Thomas. <laughs> you see, that's what we should do. We should all be part of Congress or part of the Supreme Justice, but that'll never happen. So there's a, there was a soundbite that I was going to play for Smark Rage on his departure, to which I would like to go ahead and dedicate to the United States government as it pertains to them trying to put their hand in my wallet. Get the F out! And that's the nice way to say it. Right now there are that's pandas Cena. somewhere dying. <laughs> John Cena and pandas. Hell of a combination, <laughs> hell of a combination. There you go. But Jonathan, you do, you do so much... Uh, with the independent scene, is there something going on right now uh, with everything that you see that you would like to bring to the forefront, kind of give them their uh, their just dues, and may bring, maybe bring to light a storyline, an angle, a wrestler that, that you've seen that you're just like, this guy or this angle or this woman isn't known, but they should be, sir? Oh, that's uh Hmm me on the spot okay well then well then we'll, 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 we'll let's think about it and we'll go to eddie eddie yes <laughs> the 26th of this month pell city alabama yep global yep. championship wrestling you are commissioner sir for those that have missed the show what has been lined up so far for this tv taping sir well coming up on saturday night january the 26th in pell city at the pell city civic center The GCW Global Championship Wrestling Heavyweight title will be on the line in the rematch. The new champion, I can still call him new, um, O'Hagan, will be defending against the former champion, the leader of the underground, Micah Taylor. One-on-one action. Believe me, for those who have seen Micah and O'Hagan going at it over the last year at various venues around the Southeast, I guarantee you both men are ready to step it up that much more. Also, the GCW Global Championship Wrestling Television Championship will be on the line in a career versus career match. The current defending champion, the one-man swarm, the Inhuman Fly, defends against longtime nemesis and rival in the Mystic Mudbone. If Mudbone wins, 
He gets the television championship and the career of the Inhuman Fly comes to an end. If the Inhuman Fly wins, he retains the television championship and the career of the man from San Monique comes to an end. Saturday, January the 26th, and more will be divulged in the upcoming days. Matter of fact, this coming Sunday night, 9 Central, 10 Eastern, um, GCW Radio, we're going to have the full rundown for the lineup for the 26th. Are you sure you're going to have the full rundown? Right here on the Beyond Ringside Radio <laughs> Network. See, that was my self-auto tune for whatever reason. I do apologize. <laughs> uh, what, what does Beyond Ringside get coming up this Sunday, sir? We are in communication with a number of different people because, as a lot of people may or may not know, Saturday, February the 2nd in Pennsylvania, it is National Pro Wrestling Day. This is a day-long event. Ten matches during the afternoon segment, ten matches at the evening segment. You have got Evolve Pro Wrestling, Chikara. Wrestling is fun. Wrestling is awesome. Um, New York Wrestling Connection. There are so many different promotions that are going to be represented in Pencil, excuse me, Pennsylvania on this day. This is a wrestling fan's dream, and I do mean a real wrestling fan's dream. It's, I believe, nationalprowrestlingday.com. This will also be an iPay-Per-View event through SMVOD. I believe it's going to be $15 for the day and night segments combined. I may be wrong. I'm going to double-check because I've got a phone call in to the organizers of the pay-per-view. Um, we're hoping to have all the information coming up about the final lineups in place for National Pro Wrestling Day. Once again, dude, this is going to be incredible. The word awesome is an understatement. Great would be a smack in the face because it's a wrestling fan's wet dream and then some. All you have to know is that is that friend of the show and my brother from another mother, Sugar Dunkerton, will be <laughs> on that very uh, was, isn't he doing the afternoon show? I think Jonathan. he is. Oh, well, yeah. Jonathan interviewed him Monday. Okay, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, we had Sugar on the show uh, in Georgia Wrestling Now on Monday, and he talked about that. He's part of the Beyond Wrestling yep. match, and I believe Beyond Wrestling is sort of who put it together. They are, but it also has Ring of Honor and Kaiju Big Big Battle. Yeah, how you pronounce that. yeah, actually, Kaiju Big that, yeah, we've actually got a call in too. All that different from monstrosity, really. Um, yes, yes. <laughs> but <laughs> oh no, hold on, hold on. The uh, only thing is, is that, that you guys use, you know, like zombies, Wolfman, Kaiju Big Battle uses. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. I, uh, what would that be? Gavin Loudspeaker had named him. God, what do you call him, Eddie? I'm trying to. Cool for him. I'm trying to remember. It's been a while. I've got the oh. interview up on the podcast side. I'm going to go back and listen to it. <laughs> it's a oh. Japanese influence thing, so they're. Robots and anime, Japanese animation, type yeah. things, anime characters and Gold stuff. Zero. It's uh, it looks like a lot of fun, and I think it's cool that they're in the mix with Ring of Honor, Beyond Wrestling, and all that other stuff. Like you know, taken seriously as wrestling on that uh, pro Res- National Pro Wrestling Day thing. Those ice creams, uh, they will be there. Oh <laughs> yes, that's, that's my favorite. Um, well. I have some stuff to mention now. Okay, yes, Sunday. sir. Sunday um, in Gainesville, it'll be Pro Wrestling Resurrection's debut in Gainesville. Yes, and they're oh, doing Matt the uh, yeah Matt Sex Sells as part of this show. Um, but it's the Jason Speed Six Man Tag Team Showcase Memorial. I think all of those words are in the name of the event in a different order from what I said them, but. It is a memorial for Jason Speed, who was a big part of PWR as well as B&T Pro Wrestling and its other previous incarnations. And he is no longer with us, so they're doing a, a big event. And Georgia Wrestling Now is probably going to be doing a live broadcast there this Sunday. We're just waiting to find out if we have the internet access and stuff that we would need to do that. Uh, but oh, yeah, aside from that... that. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Uh, I know that in Porterdale, PCW has a big rematch for the PCW and Empire titles when Shane Marks defends against Mason, which was also the main event of Sacred Ground Chapter 3. Um, I know Rampage has a big show this Sunday. 
and uh, Sugar Dunkerton is part of that PWR thing on Sunday too, which was part of the reason why we had him on the show on Monday. But he's involved with so many other things uh, that he had plenty more to talk about. But that's what I know of that's coming up over the next few days, at least. Is there uh, somebody out there <coughs> that that you've seen that's kind of like, hmm, you know, not like Shane Marks. Shane Marks, the revelation, you know, very well known. Is there somebody out there that you've seen kind of start to coming up through the ranks that uh, that maybe nobody really knows about yet, but they should? Or they will eventually? Well, I think Fred Yehi, I mentioned him earlier, um, he's he may already be at that point at this at this point in his career, but I'm not quite sure if he is or not. But he uh, he tied for best or most improved in the Georgia Wrestling Awards. I think if there had been a Rookie of the Year or Best Newcomer, he would have taken that for sure. But that category doesn't exist. But uh, like I said, he was mostly known as a PCW guy, and now he's out. He's uh, he's doing Mark Grayson's show this weekend, Classic, I think it's called Classic Pro Wrestling. Yeah. And he's, uh, he's like I said, he's UIW Internet Champion. He's part of, he's he's still in the tournament for the MCW uh, title because he defeated uh, Strict Nine. And uh, where else? I, I don't know. He may be part of that PWR show on Sunday. I'm not sure. But he's a guy that's uh, still very new. Oh, and he also has a YouTube show called BACW, Battle Action Championship Wrestling. I believe he is the champion of that, and it's sort of uh, started out as a backyard wrestling thing, but now they now they have a more uh, legitimate-looking facility. But it's done kind of like Beyond Wrestling, where it's recorded in front of... Uh, in an empty empty room, basically, aside from the other wrestlers and people that are involved with the show watching. And uh, I think that's something that Fred put together or is, or is definitely very involved with putting together if he's not the main guy behind it. So um, he's a guy that you can... Maybe that's why it's fitting that he's an internet champion <laughs> in UIW for a promotion that doesn't even have a website. He's an internet champion because he has an internet presence, I guess, elsewhere. But um, trying to think if there's anybody else like that. It's not already. I think average. Fred's a good one. Uh, I've actually got the chance to work with Fred. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just going to say this. This sounds arrogant as fuck. It's not meant to be <laughs> arrogant by any means. Those that know me know this Eddie's laughing because he knows exactly where I'm about to go with this yep I meet so many fucking people I feel like the Chinese guys or the Asian guys uh, at the bodegas from Half Bait were like hey black ass why you didn't moon us earlier eh I don't remember people I have to work with you like eight or nine times before I remember you I mean that's God's honest truth nothing against you between bouncing between wrestling between radio shows I mean it's just but you meet so many people that you just I mean they just come and go there's some people I meet that I'll never meet again some people that I casually meet uh, people come up to me all the time and they give me that look wicked what's going on and then I'm like hey what's nice to meet you and they look at me like nice to meet you and then look they, you don't know me I, I'm sorry I don't know you Fred's one of those guys that not a lot of people know, but I'm telling you right now, Jonathan is 100% correct. He is getting places and going places and getting out there and paying his dues. That is a big part about it. Uh, PCW had some great talent, and it was like ECW. Uh, those guys were very loyal to Steve Platinum, and mm -hmm. they refused to work anywhere else. Those guys would pay, would turn down paid bookings just to work with with Steve and for Steve for free. Jonathan, am I correct? Uh, that's my understanding a lot of the time, yes. 
and Steve Steve would bring out the best in people. He just had that uh, that Paul Heyman uh, intangible, that charisma that made you that that made you want to work better. And now all those guys, now that PCW, I know there's a PCW out of Portadale, but that's not Stephen Platinum's Platinum Championship Wrestling. Is it even called Platinum Championship Wrestling? It is, and uh, and as far as I as far as I know, he still is uh, heavily involved in the booking from afar. And then Shane Mackey kind of does the on the fly stuff, you know, at the shows, depending on who actually shows up and things like that. Oh well, the, uh, there you so go. He, he's still involved, but he's definitely not nearly as hands on as he as he was before he moved to Florida. It's uh. <clears throat> It's great to see those guys, especially uh, the Revelation Shane Marks. I said this when I first met Shane almost three years ago when he was working and he was one of the biggest baby faces that they had. I said, if you ever turn heel, oh, my God, the sky's the limit for you. And he's like, oh, well, you know, I, I don't think I will. Uh, but he did, and he has uh, – all those guys, just, just great, great stuff. Uh, I think another – Another guy that is mostly known from PCW is Casey Kincaid, um, formerly known as Phantom, and in MCW he has taken that, taken on that gimmick once again. Um, and he's been around for quite a while, but and he's wrestled elsewhere and even wrestled in other parts of the world. But um, he's still a guy that, kind of like Shane Marks. Um, but not Shane Marks is getting some recognition now, and I feel like Casey Kincaid is someone who still hasn't gotten the recognition he deserves. And I feel like he's a guy that's just in the past few years that I've seen him wrestle for PCW, and of course now he's doing UIW and Monstrosity and different things too. Um, but he's come a long way just in the past two or three years that I've been seeing him, not just developing his gimmick and persona but also his talents in the ring and I think uh, his size may be something that hinders him a little bit but I mean there's a lot of small guys he's he's not smaller than Chip Day or you know some of the other guys that are doing well so I think he's someone who still could become a more, more of a household name in the Georgia wrestling scene now, Casey, for those that don't know, uh, is a well-built guy, a very in-shape individual. Casey, what do you mean by uh, his size? The fact he's about four foot four. <laughs> That's only and a not like exaggeration. Fan, fan, of course, come on, Jonathan. Of course, he's really about five foot three. <laughs> I mean, God's honest truth, he's about five foot two, five foot three. Uh, but yeah. Phantom Casey Kincaid, hell of a wrestler. Hell of a wrestler. He used to do the, uh, what was it, like the Phantom Open, the Phantom Invitational at PCW, where he yeah. would have uh, the best of seven matches. Him and Vandal. Mm-hmm. See, now Vandal's a guy. Vandal hadn't done a lot outside of uh, PCW until I started booking him when I was uh, booking for ACW. And I used him, uh, Blaze, Jeter, De La Vega, and uh, Naja. Uh, and of course Pandora Pandora and Nina of course and Marco Polo on a regular basis but Vandal's one of those guys I think he was aside from Pandora and Shane Marks who of course were phenomenal in that I think Vandal was like the standout of all those guys the sky's the limit for Vandal Uh, Vandal now does uh, Piedmont Yeah, and I'm he's working. doing. He's been doing anarchy. He's been working at anarchy and uh, Nogicism too. He's been in an anarchy and in, I believe he's one of the tag team champions in Pro South. He is. Uh, th- those guys. I mean, I think one of the best things I know. This is going to hurt a lot. One of the best things was that happened was for PCW the pl- Steve Platinum's version of it. Uh, to go away from the Academy Theater and for those guys to take better bookings and more bookings because I mean they're getting out there and now they're starting to become names in Alabama, Georgia and in Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina that's just but that's yeah. just my opinion well I mean it's, yeah 
it's kind of kind of weird to put it that way, but I've I've had similar thoughts. It seems like you know, like you said, a lot of those guys were so loyal to see that they would turn down other opportunities, and now they're not turning those opportunities down. Um, but I think that also is still a reflection on PCW because a lot of these guys are still known as PCW guys. So no yep. matter where they go, that's what they'll be. And there's nothing wrong with that because PCW, uh, PCW from 2009 on, uh, had a great name because of great talent and great booking. Uh, Steve Platinum, very, asyn- very eccentric, <clears throat> very vocal, very over the top, very dramatic about things, but he knew what he wanted and he knew how to get it from you. That's just how it goes. Eddie, there was something you were wanting to say before, uh, before we go, sir. Yeah, we were talking about indie shows coming up, or um, shows coming up. Yes, sir. For our friends down in the Sunshine State of Florida, Vintage Wrestling Florida, or Vintage Florida Wrestling, has a show coming up, Wrestle Brawl. Four this Saturday night, January the nineteenth. It's going to be at the Salvation Army Gym, seven hundred West Twenty Fourth Street in Sanford. Tickets are only fifteen dollars. General admission. Doors open at seven. Bell time is eight. Double main event. Chairs, ladders, and tables for the vintage tag team titles. Beast mode with Justin Michaels takes on Says and Beasley, taking on Team Lucha with Leva. Once again, that's a three-way chairs, ladders, and tables. For the vintage tag titles. And in the main event, Francisco Siazzo. If you haven't had a chance to check this guy out, trust me, you want to. We'll be defending the vintage heavyweight championship against a good friend of ours here on the Beyond Ringside Radio Network. Formerly one half of the NWA World Tag Team Champions, Corey Chavis, going for the gold. That's in Sanford this Saturday, Vintage Florida Wrestling. And for anybody that's out there, and I don't want anybody to break any laws or anything, uh, if that Mr. St. Laurent guy's out there, somebody kick him in his, in his nuts as hard as they can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, real quick, one thing. I have now found one of my new fa- – my, a lot of people who know you and I know the fact that one of my favorite names in pro wrestling or and or sports entertainment was another person out of, I believe, the Sunshine State of Florida who called himself Maximum Capacity over 500 pounds i now have a new favorite nickname or gimmick name in the sport of professional wrestling thunder frog this is too cool dude <laughs> thunder frog all right no he's actually part of the wrestling is awesome match at national pro wrestling day proud oak and thunder frog in tag team action courtesy of wrestling and auction taking on devastation corporation on um february the 2nd I swear to God, if Thunder Frog don't jump off Mossy Oak or whatever the hell his name is, I'll be highly upset. It's like a tree frog. Tree frog! I'm going to get this guy for an interview. <laughs> oh, my God, Eddie, don't do that shit. I don't know, Frog. Yeah. I hope his answer is a frog splasher of some sort. <laughs> it better be. If it's not, if it's not the frog splash or the tadpole splash, I'll be highly upset. If he does the frog splash and the person stands up and goes, damn, tastes like chicken, I'm going to run like hell. Okay, that was horrible. I know. You see, you, you hear that joke that's horrible. Let me just say, Eddie, make sure we need to have like some type of screening process before we bring people on for a Beyond Ringside. <laughs> so we don't get some stupid guys, man. Eddie's booked some people on Beyond Ringside. God, God help his soul. He gives these guys opportunities to come on and talk about their their shows, and they're just horrible. Yeah, I know. They're just horrible. They come on, and Eddie's like, okay, well, you know, well, uh, this and that, and they'll talk about, yeah, uh-huh. And it's like no, I've, had that on, I've had people like that on my show too. Oh my god, I cannot send that. I just uh Oh and there was remember there was the one that you, myself, and Mabo um interviewed over on BR and lo and behold the poor guy didn't know crap about the company and the owner of the company yes. asked him to call in. Yes. And he was supposed he, to be a manager slash lawyer for the company and was just like absolute put it this way. I love Oscar Worthy's character. I love his delivery. Oscar Worthy, formerly of Platinum Championship Wrestling. Um, Oscar is one of a kind. This guy made Oscar Worthy sound like Gabriel standing at Heaven's Gates as far as his delivery goes. The the lawyer was just so overly dramatic. You're sitting back going, would somebody please give this fuckhead a might all so he'll simmer down and actually wake up? Yeah, but he was like he was like trying to live his gimmick and trying to work us and yeah, everything, no. and and he wasn't and he was not prepared at all. No, Jonathan, you know those guys that come in, you start asking Windsor, they're like, oh, so uh, how can everyone get in touch with you, Windsor, next show? Uh, 
I don't know. Give give me a second. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, check out my website. You're like dumbass. You're being interviewed. You should know this. <laughs> oh, we went yeah. a little over time. Uh, Jonathan Williams of Wrestling World Pop Culture uh, fame. Thank you, sir, for all you do. Thank you for covering uh, independent wrestling. Anything you'd like to say before we go, sir? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think we pretty much covered everything. Okay, thank you for being Thanks on for having tonight, me. sir. Oh, yes, sir. Anytime, sir. Anytime, doors always open. Fast Eddie Lane, the Magic City Motor. Anything you'd like to say before we go, sir? I'm going to run this light speed. Three great parties, three great nights, three locations. Tomorrow night, Buffalo Wild Wings in Trustful. Friday night, Buffalo Wild Wings, Alabaster. Saturday night, I'll be at Mulligan's um, on Cahaba River Road. Uh, this coming Sunday, working on Beyond Ringside at 6.30 Eastern, 3.30 Pacific. And Global Championship Wrestling's GCW Radio comes on at 11, excuse me, at 10 Eastern, Seven Pacific, I think. I got to get my damn time zone straight all over again. That's right. Nine o'clock right. Eastern. Um, and of course, be sure to check out beyondringside.com and fast eddie lane, L A Y N E dot com. You got all the contact information there, Wick. Ladies and gentlemen, you can reach us at Beyond Ringside on Twitter, also at the TBD show on Twitter, myself at Wicked Nemesis. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time for listening to us rant, rave, and bitch a little. This is the To Be Determined show right here on Beyond Ringside Radio Network. For everyone tonight, thank you all. Corey, thank you. Jonathan, once again, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, go out support local independent wrestling. This is the Oracle of Ominous, the Architect of Intellect. Something's going to happen January 22nd. Shamrocks and shenanigans. Thank you all.